fare bene il proprio mestiere. Non diventare semplicemente dei funzionari comuni di un'Europa disuguaglianza. Mafia significa anche impoverimento. Un treno che parte, una scuola che apre. Un... Perché dovrei preoccuparmi? Capiscono che la mafia è tanto più forte quando una parte si fa. Ma la scienza ha senso che i contratti in sé non sono né buoni né buoni. Qualche volta i sogni si realizzano, eh, devo dire che... I must say that uh, since the first uh, time we had the festival, we had tried to invite you at the festival. At last, after 10 years, we managed. And uh, I would like to uh, thank... Uh, personally, uh, Rob uh, Johnson and Aine, who really made uh, uh, this dream uh, true. And so we are happy to have you here. I, I don't think uh, there is a need to introduce uh, our guest. Uh, uh, well, uh, m maybe statistics do not tell the truth, but they say that uh, the Joe Stiglitz is uh, uh, the fourth uh, ever uh, influential economist in the history. There is something which uh, I can uh, quantify uh, during my studies of economics. I can tell you that our guest has given very uh, important contributions in many fields. And uh, let me tell you that uh, on Sunday at 7 p.m., together with Tony uh, Atkinson, a uh, lecture in public economics will be uh, presented. So that will be a great opportunity to listen to Joe Stiglitz together with uh, Tony Atkinson. Uh, he contributed a, a lot uh, with uh, industrial organization and also to corporate finance. Also in the field of macroeconomics with the theories on uh, multiple uh, equilibrium. And he also uh, was uh, very active uh, with a very important contribution in the field of environmental economics. Uh, but uh, last but indeed not least, another important uh, thing uh, uh, is the uh, contribution to the um, economics of labor, such as uh, Shapiro Stiglitz's model on the opportunistic behavior of workers and unemployment as a form of discipline. Uh, a common uh, feature uh, in this work, and uh, the one uh, for uh, which he received uh, the Nobel Prize together with the uh, Akebuk and Spencer, who were uh, guests uh, uh, in the past uh, in a Trento Festival. They have always stressed uh, the issue of information asymmetry. In uh, the model I mentioned before, there are workers uh, whose uh, commitment uh, cannot can only be uh, partially controlled by the boss there are models of corporate financing where uh, the uh, the boss uh, uh, indeed is the one knowing the conditions of profitability of a company and this is also asymmetric a special care in all the models was given to the issue of uh, distribution and the effects of these models and the imperfections uh, of markets in the uh, distribution of uh, wage, the ratio between capital and uh, work, and uh, uh, wage uh, distribution. Behind that, uh, indeed, uh, there should be a passion as he states in uh, his uh, uh, autobiography, uh, that comes uh, from uh, being born in the Midwest of the U.S., a part of the uh, U.S. Uh, which had a lot of uh, social uh, conflicts uh, with uh, strikes and uh, problems of jobs in the heavy industry. He is uh, very well known uh, for being maybe the only economist who, for 30 years online, uh, uh, published at least five articles in the top five 
journals, which is uh, indeed very difficult. Um, uh, but he complains uh, and states, uh, well, writing scientific articles is thorny because you have to concentrate on very specific issues. Uh, on the contrary, I like to establish links. Uh, uh, recently, he uh, indeed uh, published uh, uh, um, the uh, Great uh, Divide. I think he will mention that. Uh, but there are many, many books uh, which are known uh, to uh, a wide audience. Uh, besides that, he also could establish these links and connections as a chief economist at the World Bank and, indeed, in his role as chairman of Council of Economic Advisors of President Obama. Well, uh, the issue of distribution uh, is a, a key point in his studies. He also uh, explained the Great Recession based on uh, inequalities. Uh, there was another author explaining uh, that crisis uh, based uh, uh, on inequalities. That was given by Raghu Rajan, who uh, is the uh, chief of the uh, Central Bank of India. He has a different point of view. So without further ado, and uh, my apologies for uh, uh, we uh, are a bit late. He was here on time, but we just had to wait for the audience. So without further ado, uh, I give the floor uh, to you. And thank you very much again for being with us. Presentation is new. A PowerPoint presentation. Well, while they're getting into work, let, let me say it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, also to thank uh, INEP for okay. helping. Here there it, it goes. Here yeah, it is. Uh, arrange it. Um, as as was mentioned, uh, my own interest in inequality uh, developed partly because uh, I grew up in Gary, Indiana, which is an industrial town on the southern uh, shores of Lake Michigan. Uh, it, the history of Gary very much reflects the history of industrialization and deindustrialization in the United States. Uh, it was started, uh, founded in 1906 as the largest integrated steel mill in the world. Uh, it was a company town, um, illustrated by the fact that the name Gary uh, it was named after the chairman of the board of U.S. Steel. So you can't be more corporate uh, <laughs> than that. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I saw around me enormous amount of inequality, large amounts of racial discrimination. Uh, the, the parents of my classmates, epi, you know, every, every few years were unemployed as the economy went into a recession or as they went on strike. But what I didn't know when I was growing up, that that was the golden age of capitalism. Uh, that was as good as it ever got. Um, I didn't really realize that uh, in a way until I, I uh, read Piketty's book, where he has these graphs, which I'll show again, some of them, where you see uh, inequality was at the lowest level in the history of capitalism in this period in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but it was because I was so interested in inequality and what I thought was not working well uh, that I went into economics. I had planned to major in physics, but I kept uh, the, the issue of why was there such inequality in a rich country like America? Why was it in, the United, in Gary growing up, there were people, large numbers of people I knew, who, whose parents had not even graduated, uh, had only gotten six years of education, who were living in poverty. How could that be in this richest country in the world? And so that question really drove me into economics. My thesis was written under uh, Bob Solow, who's one of the great economists uh, uh, ever, um, and it was written on inequality. Uh, at the time, and even until quite recently, to many economists, uh, 
it was simply wrong to talk about inequality. In fact, Bob Lucas, who, who is another Nobel Prize winner teaching at University of Chicago, once, not very long ago, said the, the most poisonous subject for any economist to talk about, the, the worst subject, was to talk about inequality. And unfortunately, too many economists listened to him. And uh, inequality was not part of the subject taught in any graduate course, almost in the United States, and unfortunately many countries follow the United States, and so also in Europe, uh, also in other countries around the world. Well, the, the main chapter of my thesis uh, was uh, called The Distribution of Income and Wealth Among Individuals. Uh, it was published in Econometrica uh, in 1969. Uh, I recently reread it. Uh, I still think it's uh, a great article, and I encourage <laughs> uh, uh, all of you to read it. It really frames the whole subject. But it did not get as many readers as a couple of years, about four years ago, I wrote an article in Vanity Fair. Uh, on the same subject, and I discovered that if you write in Vanity Fair, you get more readers than if you write in Econometrica. <laughs> but the title of my... <laughs> the, the title of the article in Vanity Fair uh, also told a story. The title of the article was of the 1%, for the 1%, and by the 1%. And it really summarized uh, a lot of my views about inequality. For those of you who, who don't know American history, it was echoing uh, a very famous speech made by President Abraham Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War of the United States. It was called the Gettysburg Address, and we all Every young American had to memorize this speech. And the critical line, he was trying to explain to America why we were fighting and so many people were dying. And he said it was so that government of the people and for the people, uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people will not perish from this earth. And uh, what I was saying, well, it actually has disappeared. We now have government of the 1%, for the 1%, and by the 1%. Uh, what I want to, to uh, do this evening is to try to describe some of the ways in which inequality has grown, try to explain some of the reasons, some of the consequences, and uh, what we can do about it. Uh, obviously, I'm going to have to go very fast because you can't do all that in uh, uh, 40 minutes, and I'm going to use a few slides just to enable me to go uh, faster, um, and hopefully it'll work. It doesn't. They got the title right. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't work? Oh, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, there. Oh, is. there's a lag. If it is, it's, yeah. Okay. So. More lag. Uh, <laughs> There's been an enormous uh, increase in inequality, especially in the United States. And just so the United States has the highest level of inequality uh, of any of the advanced countries. But unfortunately, many countries are trying to imitate the United States. And the countries that have done the best job in imitating the United States have succeeded in getting almost as much inequality as the United States. Um, and I have to say that at the top of the list uh, is the United Kingdom, but Italy is not far behind. <laughs> so it's doing a good, up. A, a good job. You'll see it in some of the charts that I'll come to. Uh, there are many dimensions of inequality. You can't summarize something as complex of a whole society in just one number. There's more money at the top, there are more people in poverty, and there's been an evisceration, what we sometimes a hollowing out of the middle. Uh, there are also many aspects of the inequality. 
their inequalities in wealth exceed those in income. There are inequalities in health, and especially in a country like the United States where we don't have a national health service, and you see it, it, you know, the life expectancy of a poor American is years shorter than the life expectancy of a rich person. So there are just huge gaps in inequality. And the life expectancy of poor Americans is, is actually decreasing. In a world in which there's better health and life expectancy in general is going up. There are also inequalities in access to justice. Uh, young Americans every day when they go to school, uh, we have a ritual where you pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And at the end, they say, with justice for all. And now we have to change that. So now we have to say, with justice for all who can afford it. <laughs> because if you're poor, you can't get justice in the United States. Well, let me try to show in a few charts uh, some of the uh, numbers. <laughs> uh, here is one that uh, many of you may have seen that just reflects the fact that inequality uh, historically reached, uh, this is the top 1%, a very high level right before the Great Depression, came down very markedly in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then increased again to very high levels uh, right before the Great Recession, that the top 1% gets about 20 to 25% of all the income. That's a ratio that's twice as much as it was. The ratio, the, percent, the share of the top one-tenth of 1% 1 has increased in the last 30 years by three to fourfold. Uh, there are more charts, but uh, given the speed of changing the charts, it, uh, I'm going to skip them. But this is a, a, a chart that that uh, I like a lot. Um, one of the uh, ideas that many people who j try to justify inequality put forward is that, oh, don't worry about the top. The top may do well, but that will help everybody else. The top are the job creators. Uh, it's an idea I'll come back and talk about trickle-down economics. Uh, Mitt Romney, who was one of the 1% and was a candidate for president in the United States, uh, interestingly kept his money in the Cayman Islands uh, because money grows faster in the sunshine <laughs> there. Uh, it's, it, any of you want to know where does money grow fast, it's the Cayman Islands. Um, but uh, this chart shows that that's not true. While the top 1% saw their incomes increasing enormously, those in the middle, median, half above, half below, have an income today in the United States that's lower than it was a quarter of a century ago. And this is an average of various groups. Median household is, the, you know, is an average of, of um, um, uh, men, women, uh, various groups. One group that I feel uh, some uh, empathy for uh, are males. And uh, median income of a full-time male worker in the United States is lower than it was 40 years ago. So if you want to understand why there's such anger in American politics, in some parts of America, I think nothing tells that more strongly than this chart, which points out for more than four decades, uh, incomes have stagnated in the middle. But even worse than that is if you look at the bottom. The real wages, the minimum wage uh, 
adjusted for inflation at the bottom uh, in the United States is lower than it was 60 years ago. So can you imagine a, uh, somebody for 60 years getting no pay raise? But if you're at the bottom, that's uh, what's happened. Another way of, of putting this uh, is that all the fruits of the growth in the United States have gone to the very top. I don't know if I'm not strong enough or something. Anyway, um, you, can see, you can see here how the minimum wage of the United States has been going, adjusted for inflation, has been going down and down. Uh, it's a little higher than it was under the first Bush and the second Bush administration, but it is lower than it was in 1955. Uh, you can also understand why there's a strong uh, political movement today to increase uh, wages, minimum wage. And this just, uh, for those of you who couldn't see it quickly enough, uh, that was a chart that you just missed um, showing inequality across households. And there you see number one was the United States, number two was the United Kingdom, but number three was Italy. So, oh, there you're back again. Okay, so there you see uh, those are the highest, and then it goes way down, and at the, the most equal societies, as you would have expected, are the Scandinavian countries like Denmark. Well, the most invidious aspect of inequality, in my mind, is inequality of opportunity. Many of you may know that you know, the United States talks about the American dream. But when we look at the data, uh, it's a myth. Now, what does that mean? Well, um, the, uh, of course, there are some people who make it from the bottom to the middle or the bottom to the top. What a social scientist or an economist means is what are the life prospects? What are the probabilities? And in those terms, the prospects of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in almost any other country. Now, that really relates to the theme of this conference, which is social mobility. Uh, and uh, even old Europe, most of old Europe has much more mobility, social mobility, than the United States. In a way, this is not a surprise, because what we've understood in recent research in the last 10 years is that there's a high correlation between inequality of income and inequality of opportunity. If you have a lot of inequality of income and wealth, then those at the top manage to give advantages to their children and you wind up with a lot of inequality of opportunity. You can undo that sometimes with good public education, but in a country like the United States where we have locally based education, that means if you are poor, you live in a local area, and your likelihood is that you will get a poor education, and therefore your life prospects will not be uh, very great. And one of the concerns is that economic segregation has been increasing in the United States. That is to say, rich people live increasingly with rich people and poor people with poor people, and that has meant the country has become even more divided. So the, there's an increase in economic uh, 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 division. So we, this is a little chart that shows the relationship between income inequality and earnings mobility, uh, opportunity. And there you see at the, at the uh, bottom uh, right hand, Denmark, the country with the lowest level of inequality and the highest level of mobility. And at the very top, you see the United States, Italy, and UK, the three countries with the most inequality and by a long measure, the lowest level of mobility. So uh, that should be uh, of concern. The, the 
What I want to do now, if I can get the slide to change, is to talk about some of our change, the, some of the major changes in understanding of inequality over the last 10 years. The first I've already hinted at, which is that trickle-down economics doesn't work. Sometimes I say I wish it did because we've thrown so much money at the top that if trickle-down economics worked, ordinary Americans would be very well off, and that would be true in most of the European countries as well. In spite of the fact that trickle-down economics has never worked, there's no evidence, no theory, the Obama administration uh, and the Fed have been trying uh, trickle-down economics. And I uh, want to correct, I don't know if it was the translation, uh, I, I think it said that uh, I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under Obama, and I just want to oh, make sure Clinton. it was on Clinton. I said, I said Clinton. Oh, okay, I want to make sure it was Clinton, no, no, Clinton. because, because Clinton. Uh, no, uh, Clinton We had did, last year. Clinton. No, no, okay, because uh, uh, Obama tried this, uh, this trickle-down sure. economics, and I want to make sure that, that uh, you understand I, I was trying to stop him uh, from doing that, and I don't want to be blamed uh, <laughs> for, for his uh, mistaken policies. Um, so um, what they did is, their idea was throw enough money at the banks and everybody in our economy would do well. What I told him he should be doing was helping the ordinary Americans who were being, millions of them were thrown out of their homes, lost their homes, the massive foreclosures. I said, rather than spending all this billion on the banks, hundreds of billions, why don't you help ordinary Americans? That's what you were elected on but they decided not to do that. The Fed has tried the same thing. It's quantitative easing policy. One of the main mechanisms is the lower interest rates to get the stock market bubble up. And the idea was if you get stock prices up, everybody will do well. Well, if you get stock prices up, the 1% who owns all the stocks does very well. And it did help a little bit, but very little. And I don't know if you saw the GDP number for this first quarter of, uh, for the US. Um, it was minus 0.7%. So the US is going back down again. Um, I had anticipated this, and uh, it shows that the US I don't want to read too much in one quarter, but what it shows is the U.S. is really not back uh, uh, health. And part of the reason they tried trickle-down economics. The second important idea is a repeal of Kuznick's law. Simon Kuznick was a, another one of the great economists of the middle of the 20th century, and he didn't call it uh, Kuznick's law, but everybody else did. And his idea was that there's good theoretical reason that in, as economies develop, in the initial stages of development, there would be a growth of inequality as some parts take advantage of new opportunities and grow it faster. But then as countries grow more, the lagging parts catch up and inequality goes down. And if you remember the chart I showed at the beginning, there was some evidence for that back in the 20s, 30s, uh, back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, when he was writing. Unfortunately, since 1980, that hasn't been true. And there's a big debate about why that is. One explanation is one, I'll, if I have time, I'll talk about a little bit more, is that of Piketty who argues effectively that inequality, a high level of inequality, is the natural state of capitalism. And that the period, this golden age of capitalism between, say, the end of World War II and 1980 was unusual, was an aberration. It was the result of the social solidarity that the war brought. That people that fought together, that, that made them want to, it created a kind of solidarity in 
even in the United States, where there's never been a high level of solidarity, but in Europe. And that kind of solidarity led to shared prosperity. So that's one thesis. The other one is that the increase in inequality after 1980 is a result of a change in policies. One way of thinking about this was from an American point of view, but there are similar ideas in Europe, Thatcher, was that Ronald Reagan said, I have a deal for you. What I'm going to do is lower the tax rates at the top. And they had been at 91%, and he brought them down to around 30%. I'm going to take away all the regulations, free up the economy, and the stronger incentives and the freeing up would lead to faster economic growth. It would lead to more inequality, but the faster economic growth would mean that even though those in the middle and the bottom got a smaller share, the size of their pie, their, the size of their sl slice of their pie would be larger. Well, he was right about one thing. He did increase inequality, even more than he hoped. But every one of the other predictions was wrong. Growth actually slowed. The period after World War II was the fastest period of growth in Europe and in America. And it was the period of shared prosperity, where every group in our society grew, but those at the bottom grew more. A statistic that really captures what went on was that the bottom 90% have seen essentially no growth in their income since 1980. It's another way of saying this is, if Reagan and those people who would advocate their policies had come, come to the American people and said, I have a deal for you. I have a new set of policies that is going to result in 90% of Americans seeing no increase in their income for a third of a century, but the top 10% is going to see an increase in their income. How many votes do you think he would have gotten? Probably some of the top 10%, but clearly the 90% would not have supported these ideas. But he never said that. He promised the opposite. And then in a series of policies, things got worse and worse. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. How do I believe, why do I believe so strongly it's not the, an inherent feature of capitalism, but really a result of the policies? Well, one of the reasons, there are many reasons, and one I want to emphasize is that the underlying forces are global in nature. There are forces of technology, forces of globalization. Those affect all the advanced countries in basically a similar way. But the outcomes, both in terms of income inequalities, wealth inequalities, and inequalities and opportunity are very different. Remember the chart? I can't go back to it because it would be too difficult. But remember the chart where you saw how different the countries were in inequalities of income, inequalities of... You see? Oh, it happened. Okay. <laughs> okay. You see the huge differences in inequality in income and inequalities in mobility. Their countries are facing basically the same economic situation. But how do we account for the differences? Mostly, it's differences in policy. Of course, that means that we have a real challenge to try to understand what it is that leads to these differences in, uh, in outcomes. What are the, uh, and, and opportunity, what are the changes uh, in, in those policies? Well, the most important point I want to make is, oops, back one. Um, uh, is that it 
it means that inequality is a result of our policies. It's not a result of the inexorable economic forces that are at play. Inequality is a choice. It's a result of how we structure the economy through tax and expenditure policies, through our legal framework, through our institutions. In even the conduct of monetary policy, even institutions like the European Central Bank. All of these affect market power. They affect the bargaining power of different groups. They affect the extent to which there's full employment. If you have high levels of unemployment, obviously the bargaining power of workers is going to be reduced. If you have a central bank like the European Central Bank which is given a wrong mandate based on a flawed set of economic doctrines that was fashionable in the 1990s and 80s when the ECB was founded, but is now totally discredited. When you have a central bank that focuses on inflation, but not on jobs, not on growth, not on financial stability, you get more unemployment. And that's one of the reasons why Europe has an average unemployment rate of 12% and America's unemployment is less than half that. Well, uh, there is a rich agenda of trying to rewrite the rules to figure out how we can create different institutions, different legal frameworks, different policy frameworks that will create more equality. And uh, in Washington a couple weeks ago, uh, the Roosevelt Institute, of which I'm uh, uh, chief economist, uh, issued this report, which you can get on their web, uh, called Rewriting the Rules. Um, it says of the American economy, but it's equally true for the uh, Italian economy, the European economies, the Eurozone. Uh, it's, uh, co uh, it says an agenda for growth and shared prosperity. And we had uh, a, a, a very big meeting in Washington uh, with the Senate, with the House uh, of Representatives, where we tried to politically push this kind of agenda with a lot of support uh, from people like uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, and for people who are trying to create a, 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 a an economy, an American economy, with uh, more equality. Another, another major change in our economic framework, uh, uh, in our understanding, is what's sometimes called the repeal of, Ar uh, of Oaken's Law. Arthur Oaken was a great economist, uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Johnson, and he said, he talked about there being a trade-off between equality and growth. That, and it's a kind of idea that has continued to be ta taught in many economics uh, departments. That view says, if we want to have less e e inequality, we will have to sacrifice economic performance. And we now know that Oaken was wrong. And that was the central message of my book, The Price of Inequality, which is available in Italian. Um, <laughs> the, the, the idea of the price of inequality was that actually the, the result of more inequality is that the economy performs more poorly. It grows more slowly, there's more instability. And this is not just a, you might call it, left-wing view. This has now become a mainstream view. The IMF has talked about how excessive inequality like that in the United States and many other countries, inequality that arises out of result, as a result of monopoly power and other market distortions, that actually leads to poor economic performance. There are many reasons for this. Uh, one of the most important is that the lack of opportunity means that we are wasting our most valuable resource. Uh, it means that if you are not born to well-off parents, you're not likely to live up to your potential. 
so i i tell my students the most important decision the most important choice that you have to make in your entire life is choosing the right parents <laughs> and if you make that ch choice wrong everything else goes bad <laughs> so there are some other changes in our understanding of inequality one of the implications of this price of inequality is that we can afford to have more equality in fact i'd argue it would help our economy and in fact, in my book, The Great Divide, I give some illustrations of economies that are much poorer than the United States, but have been growing more strongly, partly because they've made a choice, a choice of having more egalitarian policies. Unfortunately, because inequality is the result of policy, it is shaped by politics. And economic inequality especially the magnitude that you see in the United States and many of the other advanced countries, inevitably gets translated into political inequality. And then that political inequality leads to still more economic inequality. Uh, there is a, a vicious uh, circle. Uh, There are many other broader consequences to this growth in inequality and reduction in equality of opportunity. I believe it undermines our democracy, divides our society, especially when inequalities are racial and ethnic lines, which is particularly the case in the United States, which you've seen in the graphic pictures in Baltimore uh, and Ferguson, but, but uh, is true in many other, uh, even in, in European societies. Uh, one of the real concerns in the United States today is that we've come to realize that the basic necessities of what we felt, think of as a middle class society are increasingly out of reach of large proportions of our population. The United States used to pride itself of having created the first middle class society uh, in the world. And we are now becoming the first country to lose being a middle class society. Uh, we are increasingly not a middle-class society, uh, that we can't uh, even have the kind of retirement security, uh, ensuring you can send your kids to college, uh, even the ability to own a home. Well, let me spend uh, just a few minutes uh, before we open up for questions, uh, talking a little bit about uh, the other theory that has gotten a lot of attention, that of Piketty, uh, who's done an enormous service in highlighting the, the magnitude of the inequality, the fact that there was this period, the golden age of capitalism. But as I mentioned before, he emphasizes some innate properties of capitalism and I've argued it really is not capitalism, it's really the set of policies. And I think my message is a much more hopeful one because we can change those policies if we can manage the politics. We can change, change those policies within a market economy and achieve more, uh, much more equality. So he's emphasized uh, the, real, the fact that if if uh, capitalists save all their income and the rate of growth exceeds the rate, uh, uh, the rate of re uh, return on capital exceeds the rate of growth, uh, then the wealth income ratio increases. But of course what matters, uh, what the, the fact of them uh, is that the, even the rich don't save all of their income. In fact, uh, the saving rate, even at the very top, is only around 35%. And what matters is the savings rate times the rate of return on capital, and that typically is significantly less than the rate of growth. But more importantly, from a theoretical point of view, the rate of return on capital is an endogenous uh, variable. But probably the most important uh, 
uh, issue is that wealth and capital are very different concepts. Most of the increase in wealth is not a result of accumulation of savings in the usual sense. Um, if that were the case, as capital stock increased, wages would increase. You have capital deepening, there'll be more capital working with every worker. But that's not been what's happening. What's ha been happening is, if I can, what you see is that productivity of workers has been increasing in the United States. It's been going up steadily. But wages have been stagnating. And that suggests something else is going on. And what's going on are changes in the rules that allow, allow the capitalists, allow uh, 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 those in the 1% to seize a larger and larger fraction uh, of the na nation's uh, income. One of the things that's also uh, been going on is that much of the increase of the wealth is as I said, not capital, but an increase in the value of land. In fact, if you look at the actual savings, the physical savings, in the national income accounts, you can only explain something between one-half to three-fourths of the growth in the wealth-income ratio. The rest is really explained by an increase in ranks and the capitalized value of ranks, land ranks, exploitation ranks, which include monopoly power, ranks associated with political power, intellectual property. Let me just give you uh, an example besides land ranks, which is an obvious one, uh, and uh, the increase in land values are an important component. But think about one of, the, one of the things that happened before the crisis in 2008, the share value of banks was going up as a result of banking deregulation. The banks had bought favors from the government. You might say they were buying bailout rents, the value of what they would receive from government bailouts, which were in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, the value of the shares of the banks go up when there's a bigger bailout. But the wealth of the economy goes down. What is going on? The fact that the wealth of taxpayers is being going, going down because their taxes are going to go up to pay for the bailouts of the banks is not recorded in the wealth that is being measured by Piketty and by the other national income statistics. So wealth is going up as we measure it. But the real wealth of the economy is actually going down. And the same thing is true if the, if the Russian oligarchs buy more land in the Riviera and the price of land in the Riviera goes up, is France more productive? Is there more land in the Riviera? In fact, it's more difficult for people who are not in the Russian oligarchs. Oh. Obviously, one of the Russian oligarchs didn't want me to say that. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, the, the point I want to make is that the concept of wealth and the concept of capital are very different concepts. And while wealth has been going up, the real productive capacity of the economy has not been going up commensurately. Uh, what we need, of course, is to explain the growth in these various kinds of ranks, monopoly power, land ranks, uh, financial and monetary policies like quantitative easing can give rise to an increase in, can rise to an asset price bubble can give rise to the share prices going up, can give rise to land prices going up. 
but that doesn't mean the economy is really wealthier. So let me finally uh, uh, make a few uh, concluding uh, remarks. The first has to do with, with uh, quantitative easing. In a modern economy, the key distinction is not so much between debtors and creditors, but between life cycle savers and inherited wealth. These different groups in our society have very large differences in portfolio composition. The equity, the value, the shares are held by the people who have largely inherited wealth, but the life cycle savers, those who are saving for their retirement, tend to hold their wealth in more prudent forms, like in government bonds. So you can see how a policy like quantitative easing can increase inequality. You lower interest rates, stock market prices go up, the very wealthy do very, very well, but those who were saving prudently in government bonds have no income anymore. And so the retirees who depend on income from government bonds are being devastated. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do quantitative easing, but you have to understand quantitative easing, like every other aspect of policy, has very significant distribution effects. And to his credit, Draghi pointed out that these adverse distribution effects. Uh, let me go on to the final slide, if I can. Let me conclude with uh, three comments. Given the magnitude of the increase in inequality that has happened in the last third of a century, incremental changes, little perturbations, little changes, will not suffice. That what you hear from a lot of politicians are tweaking the system. A little bit of, a little bit more education, a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. What I've argued is we really need to a much more fundamental understanding of the sources of inequality, a much more fundamental change in our legal policy, tax, expenditure policies, we really need to rewrite the rules and institutions of the capitalist economy. The second point is a note of urgency. The level of inequality that we have today is the result of decisions made over the last several decades, the last third of a century. Brick by brick, step by step, we've created this highly unequal society. If we continue business as usual, if we don't change, it will mean that inequality will continue to grow as it has been growing. And it means that 25 years from now, 30 years from now, we will have an even more unequal society and a society with much less opportunity, much less mobility. So unless we begin the changes now, it's going to take a lot of effort, uh, but unless we begin now, we are baking in inequality for the next generation. And the final point is, the real question is not economics. If you left it to me, I could solve this problem. Uh, there are, you know, uh, a few things that we have to do. This is just the outline, but we could, we could write down an agenda. We could write down the legal frameworks. We know pretty well what has to be done to create a more equal society, a society with more mobility, a society with shared prosperity, where we would grow more rapidly. The real problem is that the problem is not so much uh, capital, capitalism in the 21st century. The real problem is our politics. The problem is democracy in the 21st century. Thank you.
So thank you so much for taking us to real, to the real core issues that will be dealt with uh, during this festival, you know, there is this gr great gap curve, you know, showing that uh, larger inequality involves less uh, social mobility, contrary to many uh, myths uh, about uh, the US economy and the social mobility therein. Uh, I think we can take, possiamo prendere alcune domande. I think we can uh, entertain some questions, provided they use uh, the microphone. You uh, criticize Piketty, and uh, uh, I guess Piketty is going to give a lecture. Uh, given that you consider that there is nothing unavoidable, so there is not this natural law of capitalism, um, to which extent your recipe, your agenda, clearly, you, you can't go through the entire thing, differs from the, because Piketty is very much on taxation, capital taxation and so on. You are more about, uh, Real estate taxes given land use uh, is. Well, uh, uh, if you can uh, say a few words that's about that's that, that would be that's great. That's so that yeah. can lead us into the. Sure, that's that's a, a very good point. Um, my agenda, if I was economic agenda, is is much more comprehensive. Uh, it's not just taxation. Taxes are important, but it's monetary policy, as I was uh, court for governance, uh, the rules of the game that have resulted, say, in the United States, the CEO pay going from 20 times that of the average worker to, on average, 300 times the average pay. So it's corporate governance. It's uh, the weakening of labor institutions. Uh, it's ineffective enforcement of uh, competition laws. Antitrust. Yes. Uh, antitrust laws. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's uh, bargaining right. power. It's, bargaining yes. power. It's, it's, old in, it, it's the rules governing globalization, for instance. Right now, you know, what I said, we have to rewrite the rules. One of the really important things is we shouldn't make them even worse. And a pres President Obama has proposed making things even worse. Uh, he didn't say it that way. Um, what he said was he's proposed a, tr a trade agreement with Pacific and with Europe that would make workers worse off and increase corporate power, uh, make it more difficult to regulate the environment, protect workers, uh, protect the economy. So, um, uh, you know, and there will be a big debate, obviously, in Europe, uh, and we are having that debate now, but that's an example of rewriting the rules in ways that will lead to more inequality. So that would, is where I put you know, the first emphasis. Now, when it comes to the specific issue of taxes, uh, because uh, so much of the, you might know, say, phony increase in wealth is from land and from monopoly rents, I would have very high taxes on land and other forms of rents. Mm -hmm. and one of the benefits of that is actually it will lead to more real investment. People who save, rather than have that savings go into increase in the price of land, will put it into capital goods, so it will increase the productivity of the economy. One of the difficulties of any theory of taxation, any analysis, is uh, the theory of incidence, how taxes get shifted. And you have to be very careful in the design of tax policy. And that's one of the things that, in my book with Tony Atkinson, we emphasized, and we're talking about in a couple of days uh, here, um, that if you don't design the tax in the right way, it can be shifted so that before tax income, of capitalists goes up and wages can actually go down. So you have to be sure that some of the revenue that you get is reinvested in public investment. You have to, uh, I think inheritance taxes are, are really uh, much more important than just capital taxes in general because that stops the uh, creation of an inherited uh, plutocracy. So, you know, overall, 
our frameworks are very, very similar, but it's, it, it, these, these are some of the differences between the way we approach the problem. Very good. And we'll have also a lecture on, on inheritance taxes in a few days. Grazie. But let me take <coughs> the questions. Celestino uh, Preti. No, is, uh, I, I, I decide who is, uh, if you don't mind, I mean, I decide who is, I, I, I will give you the floor in a minute. But prima lo diamo, I have signor, two questions. Scusi. You say that there is a difference between wealth and capital. Does Perhaps, it, can you stand up? Does it mean that wealth is based only upon rents? Or uh, is there another explanation? Then I have another question. You say that inequality in the United States uh, goes according to racial and ethnic uh, lines. Uh, you say that inequality can go yeah. according racial and ethnic lines. Um, what are the reasons? Why are the, uh, some, some racial and ethnic groups perform less well? Sure. Both good questions. The, the wealth is a measure of control over resources, and it includes the value of your you know, uh, financial capital, land, but also machines, physical capital. But when we talk about productive capital, the ma magnitude of, ca of, of land has not been increasing. The magnitude of monopoly rents may have increased, but that's not productive capital. But you can buy and sell monopoly rents, the right to receive monopoly rents. If you get a monopoly, your share, uh, uh, the shares in Microsoft, for instance, can be bought and sold. So that's a monopoly rent, and that's part of wealth, but if you increase monopoly power, wealth goes up, but that's not, it's actually taking away uh, well-being, if you want to think, from ordinary workers, because it leads to higher prices and that lo lowers their real wages. So that's a part of the concept, a big uh, uh, difference between this concept of wealth and capital. Land is part of wealth. Uh, and, I mean, cap and, and productive capital goods are part of wealth. But there's this other part that is not growing. And unfortunately, most or a very large proportion of the increase in the measured wealth of our economy is the increase in the value of land and other rents. And that's been uh, pointed out now by several people, but I used in my paper some OECD data that uh, look at national counts, and you can see that very, very clearly. The issue of um, the origins of racial and ethnic divisions, uh, it highlights two points that, uh, that really are central to my message. The first is that a lot of inequality is a result of market power, not of what would occur in a competitive equilibrium that has been the basis of economic analysis for the last uh, decades. So in the United States, there is very strong evidence of racial and ethnic discrimination. And even people with the same human capital, there's also gender discrimination uh, as well. And there's a long history of this discrimination, and it shows up in the statistics. Uh, the wealth uh, and income of African Americans, the poverty is just enormous. It continues. For instance, in the lead up to the crisis in 2008, there was a lot of predatory lending. The banks engaged a lot of lending uh, to try to take advantage of poorly educated Americans, financially uneducated Americans. But our biggest banks actually engaged in discriminatory lending. They targeted African Americans and Hispanics, gave them uh, different loans relative to white people. Just blatant discrimination for which they paid large fines but can't undo the damage to our society. And what's so amazing is our banks, it was like Wells Fargo, 
major American banks years after, you know, four decades after we passed legislation saying it's illegal to engage in discrimination, we're doing it. There's a kind of moral turpitude in our financial system. Now, all this is part of a, a long history in the United States of Jim Crow. Of, of some of this is, is built into our legal system. Uh, I don't know if you know about, you know, I mentioned inequalities of justice. Uh, the United States has 25% of all the world's prisoners, even though we have only 5% of the population. And disproportionately, we send African-American young men to prison. We spend more on prisons in many states than we spend on universities. And it's targeted at African-Americans. So, I mean, there's a whole literature about what's called the, Jim, the New Jim Crow. Uh, it's a, a very nice book from the New Press that, that describes uh, this. But this is a legacy of, some of this is a, a legacy of American slavery that went on for, you know, we didn't pass, uh, you know, uh, slavery ended officially in 1865, but we didn't pass our civil rights bills until 1960s after a very vigorous fight. And our banks continued to discriminate in, into the 21st century. So that's part of the issue of how you can see such uh, racial and ethnic discrimination today in America. So another hint about topics that will be dealt with at the festival. Etienne Masmer will be talking about returns to capital and showing and documenting how these are related to the housing stock. Uh, so that is an important. Um, Celestino Preti. Well, I'm a priest. I would like to thank you because uh, you really put the finger in. Uh, I would like to wish you all the best. Uh, and uh, the crisis has uh, made uh, rich even richer. And we hope uh, that uh, we can uh, read uh, what has happened uh, with uh, responsibility and hopefully Pope uh, Francis uh, um, will uh, teach us uh, how to remove uh, privileges. Uh, and I wish Mr. Boeri all the best uh, in his new role. Uh, we hope uh, that you will be able to change the culture of politicians. Uh, and hopefully, we will be able to decrease uh, the level of youth unemployment. So it was nothing, not a question. Down there. Grazie mille. Please. See, la, la, la ragazza um, hi. Um, you talk about the uh, um, economic growth, which has to increase again. But what about the environmental crisis and the ecological limits to growth and also the um, social limits to growth, uh, um, about which Fred Hirsch talked. So, thank you. You want to take more questions, or you want to yeah, ask? Yeah, I can, yeah, why don't you take a couple more others, yeah. Okay, let's take another couple. Uh, down there. La. Potete far arrivare il microfono là in fondo? La signora col vestito azzurro. La, per cortesia. Grazie. Eh, farò sicuramente qualche gaff. Well, uh, I'm very shy, sorry for that. Uh, I have a diagram before my eyes. It is a diagram which is uh, circular in nature. I don't know from where to start. You spoke about access uh, to vote uh, and about Reagan and his uh, proposal. 
But we know that uh, the American uh, voters uh, are limited in number, so the real number of people who go to the vote uh, uh, are mainly wealthy people. Hispanics, for example, tend uh, not to go to vote. Well, this was explained to me by a Canadian sociologist. There is a political scientist who says that uh, Americans uh, are responsible for uh, their situation. Please, uh, can you tell uh, what you want to ask? Well, so it's an American dream. Can you hear me? Which uh, has turned uh, upside down. So my question is, uh, so the many working hours and the very little free time, leisure time that an American has available may have an impact uh, on uh, this situation. Perhaps uh, these people do not have the opportunity to be informed uh, and be aware of what really happens in the country. Because uh, this uh, has an impact on democratic decisions. Uh, I'll finish off uh, with a proposal. Now, perhaps uh, you may ask for asylum uh, in uh, Cuba, for example. Question. In your, op in your opinion, what we can do, what is the first path to the, the first step to change the world. Uh, as you talk about uh, the urgency of the, the decision that today we have to take about this uh, topic. Not an easy question. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I think you, you can yeah. take votes. Right? Okay. okay. Well, uh, those were uh, small questions. <laughs> Let me begin by um, one important aspect of inequality that I didn't uh, have a chance to. Um, oh, here's. Okay. Yeah. So what one one aspect of inequality that I didn't get a chance to talk about was environmental inequality. Uh, and actually, it's, it is a very important aspect that, uh, and it has many dimensions. You know, uh, poor people are more exposed to environmental hazards. It has lifelong effects. Uh, there, there, there was a um, an interesting, uh, you might say, experiment that was done uh, in the United States where, where. Uh, the toll roads in New Jersey that um, they went from toll booths to to um, automatic uh, uh, electronic payment, and the result of that was that uh, the cars didn't have to pile wait so long, and it had a significant effect on the carbon monoxide in the area. And in the area around the toll booths, a lot of poor people live because people don't want to live next door to a, a, a toll, uh, to a major highway. And they were able to show that the result of this unintended experiment, natural experiment, was that the birth weight of the children went up significantly. And that the result, of, we, we know that when there's an increase in birth weight, the life prospects uh, of the children uh, are much greater. So that's just one example, but the point is that, that the way we restructure, our, we structure our society does mean that poor pe uh, children of poor families are exposed 
to significantly uh, worse environmental hazards. And that's why when we talk about environmental policy, we also ought to be very aware of the distribution consequences uh, of those environmental policies. I talked about, in, a, in discussing the economy, how the rules of the game affect the way the economic system works. And the same thing is true about politics. The rules of the game affect how the political system works. And not surprisingly, the rich, uh, in, particularly in, a, in, in some parts of the United States, have been trying to structure the political system in ways that make sure that poor people can't vote or don't vote. So a lot of the battles in the United States have been precisely over the terms on, at which uh, uh, the ease with which people can vote. So for instance, in, the more, in, in those parts of the United States who still believe in democracy, They've introduced mail ballots. You can vote by mail. So that means even if you have to work, you can vote. You don't have to give up work in order to vote. In uh, those places in the United States they care about democracy, they make it easy for you to register to vote. In those places that do not want poor people to vote, they make it very difficult to register to vote. They make it very difficult for you to prove that you are a US citizen so you can get the right to vote. So they do lots of things to, in effect, disenfranchise. But there is something else that's going on, which is because of the inequalities in political power, that I mentioned, because you have a political system that seems so often like it's of the 1%, for the 1%, and by the 1%. Because we had a president who said, change that you can believe in when he was running for office, but then once he got elected, point, appointed the same people who had led to the financial crisis as his economic advisors. There's a lot of people who have a disillusionment with the political process. And the result, the view is that it won't, doesn't make any difference how you vote. And the consequence is that voter turnout in the United States is abysmal. The voter turnout in the last election, 2014, was the lowest since World War II. And in World War II, a lot of people, all the young people, were off fighting the war, so they couldn't all vote. But our voter turnout has been going down. In 2010, the voter turnout among youth in the United States was about 20%. And we talk about democracy and fighting for democracy, and yet there is such disillusionment among young people that their view is, what difference does it make? And that's why I think it's really important to, to have this agenda of rewriting the rules so to, to feel, to, to, for them to realize that, that there is a, an alternative, uh, uh, that there are things that, that can be done. Now, uh, the hardest, uh, and probably the most important question was the last one, what should Europe do? Um, and I don't know where to begin. Um, so the first thing I would do is uh, change the structure of the Eurozone. Nothing is as bad for inequality as high levels of unemployment. And nothing is as bad for economic mobility, social mobility, as high levels of youth unemployment. And as most of you know, the average level of unemployment in Europe now is 12%. The average level of youth unemployment is 25%. But the youth unemployment in Spain is over 50%. And it would be even higher if 
so many young Spanish people hadn't left. <laughs> and the same thing, of course, uh, not, the statistics in Italy are not quite as bad, but they're not very good either. So the problem, and let me be, is not the structure of the economic structure in Italy or in Spain or in France. You know, France was growing very rapidly until 2008 and 10. Did something happen to the structure of France suddenly in 2008 or 10? Its productivity was actually growing faster and at a higher level than per hour than in the United States. They happened to enjoy more leisure, uh, but we envy their long vacations. Uh, but the, the, the point is their productivity per hour was actually higher than the United States. So there's not, you know, every country needs to improve, reform their structure. But that's not the cause of the problem. And the, 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 the analysis it says that the problem is the structure in each of the individual countries is absolutely wrong. That most of the structural reforms that are being advocated for Italy and France and the other countries would actually make the problem of unemployment worse. Because the problem in Europe is lack of demand. And most of these reforms are supply side measures that actually would reduce the demand for labor. So what is really required is a reform in the structure of the Eurozone. It's the structure of the Euro that is at fault and the policies of, of, of the Eurozone. So what are those? The, you, you, there, there is a need for uh, a, single, uh, a banking union, Euro bonds, more fiscal federation, changing the mandate of the European Central Bank to focus on employment growth, financial stability, and not just inflation, industrial policies that allow countries that are behind to catch up and that can promote economic growth, uh, ideas like the Internet, which are part of U.S. government, uh, uh, help foster that, and, and European governments help foster that through government spending that have transformed uh, the economies. Um, the, uh, there are just a, a host of reforms in the structure of the Eurozone that would lead to faster growth and lower unemployment. High unemployment hurts the poor, increases inequality in three ways. It increases it directly because people who are unemployed are hurt. It increases it indirectly because if the unemployment is high, wages get bid down. And thirdly, the lower incomes mean that government spending gets caught, cut back, and that particularly hurts those in the middle and the bottom. So to me, the most important uh, uh, issues are these reforms in the Eurozone, but then the policies of austerity, which have never worked, um, have uh, had uh, brought down growth in Europe uh, even uh, more. The reason why the United States is doing better than Europe, you know, crisis began in the United States. Why should U.S. be better off than Europe? After all, we are the source of the problem originally. But we had a much smaller dose of austerity. And if you look across Europe, the countries with the biggest doses of austerity have done the worst. So austerity is the cause of the problem. It caught, you know, Sp Spain and Ireland had a surplus before the crisis. The crisis caused the deficits and the debt. It wasn't the other way around. So the first uh, is, is to change the structure of the Eurozone, change these policies, which are killing Europe, and killing Europe today, but killing the future potential growth of Europe as well. Um, the, you know, you, you, you talk about the most important part of capital, it's human capital. The most important of human capital is on-the-job training, learning, and if you don't have jobs, you don't have on-the-job training, and that is what is being destroyed all over Europe today. Finally, I think one of the real sources of the strength of Europe is the European social model. 
the system of social protections, uh, the, 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 the system uh, that I think has worked so well in at least many of the countries. Uh, some economists have said that is the cause of the crisis. That's absolutely wrong. Draghi, in one interview at the Financial Times, said that. I think that's absolutely wrong. If you look, what are some of the countries that are doing best, the best right now in Europe? Uh, Sweden and Norway, where the European social model is the strongest. Uh, so uh, it is the European social model, the social protection, which has prevented the economic crisis in Europe from being much worse than it already is. So the most important thing uh, in, in some ways uh, to, at this juncture, is uh, to do no harm, make sure you don't make things worse by getting rid of what is already one of the real strengths of Europe. So the European social model is not bad. It's not bad at all. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can uh, conclude. Uh, we just roused some of the subjects of the Festival of Economics. Uh, at the School of Law will have a discussion on the future of Euro and uh, uh, whether uh, Europe will or will not be able to learn from the mistakes. So thank you very much, uh, Joe Stiglitz. You will be with us again. And uh, with Tony Atkinson uh, on Sunday at 7 p.m., uh, and we'll speak about lecture in public economics. Thank you and good night. Fare bene il proprio mestiere. Non diventare semplicemente dei funzionari comuni di un'Europa. Disuguaglianza. Mafia significa anche impoverimento. Un treno che parte, una scuola che apre. Un... Perché dovrei preoccuparmi? Capiscono che la mafia è tanto più forte quando una parte si fa. La scienza ha senso che i contratti in sé non sono né buoni né buoni.